Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, we hear from Professor Adrian Gregory about religion during the First World War. My name is Adrian Gregory. I am a fellow of Pembroke College, Oxford, and associate professor of the Oxford University History Faculty. I am a social historian of the First World War. I have recently been working on a large research project on global religion in the era of the Great War. It is important to remember that the United Kingdom in 1914 is still in significant ways a religious society. But what religion means to different parts of society can be very different. I would suggest that there are two very different styles of religion that you find in the United Kingdom at the outbreak of the First World War. There is the religion of respectability. This is the religion of the squire in the rural counties of England as the local patron of the Church of England. This is the religion of the Methodist businessman in the north of England or the religion of the Anglo-Jewish financier in some of the more anglicised synagogues of London. It's the religion of Church of Scotland Presbyterian professors in towns like St Andrews. So this is a religious style of elite religion and middle-class religion, the religion of respectability, which in some respects, is going into decline through the late Victorian period and into the Edwardian period as the central significance of religious respectability has become less defining for social elites. It's also, of course, the segment of society that may be most affected by the knowledge of new theological scholarship or by the impact of Darwinian science. This, I think, is very different from the religion and religious styles of much of the working class. Some of that religious style, both Roman Catholic, which is often ethnically Irish or occasionally ethnically Italian, which is very ritualistic, very much centred on priestly religion, often highly feminised. Often the women are very much those who are central to the laity, even though, of course, they're excluded from any kind of significant religious role in anything other than the very small numbers who are nuns. So this is a religion of ritualism, of sensory experience on many levels. And this is increasingly true of a lot of urban Anglicanism as well, which is taking on ritualistic and Catholic practices in an attempt to reach segments of the working class. There are even some nonconformists who are experimenting with this by 1914. And then on the other hand, you also have the working class religion, the religion of evangelical piety. Now, again, there are members of the elite who have this kind of religious style as well. But the kind of enthusiastic fervor of revivalism, the Moody and Hankey, the Salvation Army style of religiosity, I think is something that still has a presence, both in the industrial cities and also in, if you like, the industrial villages, in the areas of primitive Methodism, say, for example, in the Durham coalfields, or in the areas of Calvinist baptism in some of the parts of Wales. There is also, of course, still a residual rural piety as well in parts of Scotland, parts of rural England, and of course, overwhelmingly in much of Ireland. There are many different religious worlds at this time, including a small world of the very heterodox, the spiritualists, the theosophists, certain North American sectarian Protestantism that is beginning to come over during this period, the arrival of what would eventually become the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists. At the outbreak of war in August 1914, the major religious leaders in the United Kingdom, almost without exception, endorsed the war as a just war. Now, you would expect this of the Anglican bishops. To some extent, you would expect this, I think, of the Roman Catholic bishops, again, who have an Augustinian theology of supporting the state in time of war. 
What's slightly more surprising is the endorsement from the leadership of the major nonconformist groups. Church of Scotland Presbyterians, who are, of course, the established church in Scotland, again, have a very conventional just war theology. But it's a bit more surprising to see it being embraced by English Baptists, by Congregationalists, by Unitarians on quite this scale. A large part of that is to do with the fact that Germany can be seen as an aggressor against an innocent. The importance of the German invasion of Belgium for the nonconformist conscience cannot be stressed highly enough. But there are also some very contingent things involved. So, for example, the Baptist leader, J.H. Rushbrook, at the outbreak of war, is on his way back from an ecumenical peace conference with his German counterparts in Constance in Germany. Rushbrook is stopped and detained by the German police for quite a number of weeks. And during this time, Rushbrook turns from being a rather pro-German figure to someone who arrives back in Britain furious at Prussian militarism and preaches sermons about the absolute necessity of breaking the German system, in part with the idea of liberating the German people from the militaristic government, but certainly taking the view that Britain has to fight the war until the German political leadership as it is currently configured is overthrown. So he becomes a real crusader. Now, this is not something you could necessarily have predicted even in June 1914. Rushbrook's tendencies would have been very much the other way towards reconciliation with Germany. It's experience that puts Rushbrook in this camp. If Rushbrook had not gone to Germany in the summer of 1914, he probably would have taken a somewhat different opinion at the outbreak of war. Although all of the mainstream churches support the government fighting the war, it's important not to see that as war enthusiasm in any simple sense. And indeed, something that's often forgotten about the church's responses to the outbreak of war is that they do see the war as terrible. And they genuinely do. You see this again and again in the way that religious leaders speak about the war. But they also talk about it as punishment to England or to Scotland or to the United Kingdom or to the British Empire. And the idea, which is very widespread, is that God's wrath has fallen upon the state and people because of their sins. So many religious leaders see the war in terms of a divine retribution for pre-war materialism. So yes, they support the war effort, but they're not thinking of Britain or the United Kingdom or the Empire as an innocent party. They are thinking of it as a society which in very Old Testament terms, and there's a lot of talk about the Old Testament prophets, the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs in this period, they see that as a society that is being scourged by a wrathful God for its pre-war sins. Now, what those sins are depends a little bit on the individual leader. Sometimes it will be sins of sex. Sometimes it will be sins of too much drinking. But some of the leaders will also see it as sins of unrestrained capitalism, of sins against fellowship, of the poor treatment of the poor. So you get a very interesting mix of ideas of what it is that we have done to deserve this. And it's not a simplistic merger of the church and nationalism something actually rather different, which is the idea that the nation needs to be brought back to God through suffering. Although almost all of the mainstream leadership support the war as a just war, from quite early on, there are a significant number of people who find it hard to square war with their Christian convictions. Now, as you would expect, some of the historic peace churches and particularly the Society of Friends may be overrepresented amongst this group. But I think they're there across nearly all denominations, perhaps less so amongst Anglicans and Catholics than amongst nonconformists, but there are Anglicans and Catholics amongst them. Those who dissent against the war manifest most interestingly as the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which comes into being very early in the war, in December 1914. There are 130 delegates who meet in Cambridge 
and they're from all sorts of religious groups. The person who brings them together is a man called Henry Hodgkin, who is a Quaker, who returned, again, interestingly, from the Constance peace meeting, but wants to carry forward that Anglo-German reconciliation, unlike Rushbrook, who's rejecting it. And Hodgkin tries to bring together those who are a bit out of step with the leadership from a whole series of Christian groups. Women are quite prominent amongst them. So Lillian Stevenson, who had been the leader of the student Christian movement, is very prominent. And Lucy Gardner becomes secretary of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. She is a member of the Society of Friends, but she is actually an incredibly important religious pacifist figure during the war. There are other people, such as Muriel Lester. This group, which starts with 150 people in 1914, by the autumn of 1915 has risen to 1,500 members and has become reasonably active. Now, again, compared with the total number of religious leaders, clergy in the country, that's not a huge figure, but they're enough to be visible. And I think they are a signal from quite early on that it is possible to hold anti-war Christian views in the United Kingdom in the early years of the First World War. I think they're also a body of opinion that can stand as a particular kind of Christian witness to what they see as the onset of insanity. And they are also particularly offended by the idea of the churches endorsing the struggle and the bloodshed. Now, one figure who's there on the fringes of the Fellowship of Reconciliation meeting in December 1914, but decides he can't go with them, is the young and prominent Anglican clergyman, William Temple. Now, he's a very establishment figure. He's the son of an Archbishop of Canterbury, and he's often seen, even at this time, as an Archbishop of Canterbury in the making. A phenomenal, energetic, intelligent young man who is born to the purple. Temple has areas of unease about the war, but decides in the end, and he is very much, I think, always the establishment figure, that he would rather work within the institutions than outside them. So Temple becomes the initiator of the idea that the Church of England should use the war as an opportunity to rededicate the nation. And this becomes the idea of a national mission of repentance and hope. The repentance for the sin that has led to the war, the hope is the hope of building a better Britain coming out of the war. So this is an Anglican initiative, and it remains an Anglican initiative, really, right the way through 1916. It has friendly relationships with quite a lot of nonconformists as well. Roman Catholics are not involved because it's worth remembering that at this time, which is long before Vatican II, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't do ecumenicism. As far as they're concerned, all Protestants are schismatics and heretics, and that really is the end of the story. So the Roman Catholic Church necessarily is not involved in the national mission of repentance and hope. Through 1916, there's a tremendous amount of effort. This involves the clergy going on retreats and then coming back. There's a very interesting discussion of the idea of how to engage women with this. And the idea is put forward of women as the bishop's messengers, as being able to fulfill certain pastoral roles within the church, but not preach. This is a big push. It's very much the Church of England's Battle of the Somme. And rather like the Battle of the Somme, the results are rather disappointing. At the end of 1916, there's a general view that they've managed to preach to the converted, but they haven't converted many who were unconverted. There's an attempt to reach out to the new industrial populations. There's an attempt to go to the munitions districts. They do occasionally get a bit of an audience, but there's not much indication of any great uptick in Anglican piety. And of course, by 1916, people have got all sorts of other things on their mind. There are some non-Christians in the United Kingdom in 1914. There is a small Muslim minority composed partly of very largely South Asian Muslim immigrants into the United Kingdom and a small number, although perhaps surprisingly large for the time, of British Muslim converts. The war impacts on them primarily through the way that it changes the relationship between the United Kingdom and the Ottoman Empire. Now, the British Empire in 1914 is already seeing itself as the largest Muslim empire in the world. There are more Muslims in the British Empire than there are in the Ottoman Empire. But for reasons that are quite complex, within the British Empire, 
the Ottoman Empire is seen as having a particular spiritual significance for Muslims. This is partly to do with a phenomenon of the late Ottoman Empire, and particularly from the time of Abdul Hamid, where there is a new stress on the idea of the Ottoman Sultan as the caliph of all Muslims. This is a claim that gets taken quite seriously, particularly by Indian Muslims. When Britain goes to war with Germany, no real problem. When Britain goes to war with the Ottoman Empire, this actually does create amongst British Muslims some sense of torn loyalties. And they respond to it in different ways. For example, and one of the most prominent British Muslims of 1914, a man called Yusuf Ali, decides that really it's not a problem, that he is simply a member of the British establishment. He's a loyalist. He's one of these rather posh Indian immigrants. So he tries to put his weight and influence behind the idea that the conflict with the Ottoman Empire is not really all that important. But probably more of the prominent British Muslims in this period do see this as a problem. So Marmaduke Piptal, who is probably one of the most prominent English converts to Islam during this period, writes a series of books and pamphlets during the war trying to defend the Ottoman Empire and the Turks and saying that it's important in the long-term interests of Britain that the Ottoman Empire should continue to exist and that the Caliph should remain the Caliph. You have other figures like Said Amir Ali, who is actually a privy councillor, so he's pretty establishment and Anglophile, but he also is saying that we should try to leave the Sultan alone as far as possible and that he should be kept in place after the war. And Said Amir Ali becomes particularly vocal during the period of the peace treaty immediately after the war. And then you've got more radical figures like M.H. Kidwai who are really pan-Islamists, and the movement of pan-Islamism is coming into being at this moment. And he is really sometimes flirting around the edge of outright subversion. One thing that horrifies many Muslims in November 1917 is the Balfour Declaration, which they see as being a measure that the British government has taken against the interest of Muslims, which brings me rather neatly to the other major religious minority in wartime, the United Kingdom, which is the Jewish population. The Jewish population in Britain in 1914 is very socially divided between the relatively small numbers of long-established Anglo-Jewry, who are both of Sephardi groups who have been coming to Britain from the late 17th century and through the 18th century, often via Holland, and another establishment group that begins to establish itself from the early 19th century, which are German Jewish families of Ashkenazi, but very assimilated into British society, regardless of whether they are more orthodox or more reform. And they do see themselves as quite integrated into the British establishment, economic and political. And it's worth remembering that Britain during the war has Jewish cabinet ministers which would be pretty much unthinkable, for example, in Germany, despite the prominence of someone like Walter Rathenau, but he's never going to be in the cabinet. So, for example, Herbert Samuel, who is in the cabinet for much of the war. But the vast majority of the Jewish community in Britain in 1914 are of Russian Jewish descent who had been leaving the Russian Empire because of both economic exclusion and occasional violent persecution since the 1880s, joined by small numbers of Romanian Jews as well, just before the First World War. So this is a group which in 1914 is variably assimilated, but mostly relatively unassimilated. Indeed, quite a large part of this Russian Jewish community had not taken out British citizenship. The Anglo-Jewish community, again, overwhelmingly supports the war effort, and that is part and parcel of their desire to be seen as more English than the English. The Russian Jewish community, by and large, acquiesce in the war effort, but often with serious qualms and doubts about Britain's alliance with Russia. Russia being seen by both religious Orthodox Ashkenazi Jews, but also amongst the many Jewish socialist types, as the historical oppressor. And with good reason, the Cossacks are the archetypal persecutors of the Jewish people. 
Furthermore, in 1915, as the Russian army retreats on the Eastern Front, it does commit atrocities against the Jewish population, both in the occupied areas of Galicia and in its own territory, which gives serious concern to British Jews who are seeing their co-religionists and countrymen being persecuted. There is also in Britain a increasing perception as the war goes on, which is being expressed in right-wing circles, that the Jews as a group are not to be trusted. There is a developing language of anti-Semitism connected to the idea that the Jews, and particularly Russian Jews, are not genuinely patriotic. Now, it's certainly the case that in the East End of London, there are pockets of what might be called passive war resistance. The Rabbi Avram Kuk, who has come over from Palestine, was in Switzerland at the start of the war, ends up in London and gets put in charge of a synagogue there. He begins to enlist young Jewish men into yeshiva so that they can claim exemption as seminary students from being conscripted into the army. There is a sense amongst some Jews in the East End that this isn't really their war, that the Goyim are fighting each other. It's not that widespread, and there are plenty of East End Jews who enlist, but the East End press is claiming that that's the attitude. This also feeds all the way up through the political system to the situation where you get some members of the British establishment, particularly after the Russian Revolution in February 1917, who are beginning to see the Jews in classic anti-Semitic terms as global conspirators and manipulators. Some of these people then draw the fascinating conclusion that the best way to get them on side is to give them what they want. And part, at least, of the origins of the Balfour Declaration are, in fact, in establishment anti-Semitism. The idea that if Britain is seen to be granting the Jewish people a homeland of their own, then they will stop plotting against Britain and start plotting against Germany. It's an unpleasant story, but it is part of what's going on there. It's not the only part. There is also some philo-Semitism. There is a little tiny element of sympathy for the Jews as a historic people. And both Balfour and Lloyd George have this a little bit, the idea that they have some kind of historic connection to the Holy Land, because that's what the Old Testament says. It's not really Christian evangelical Zionism, and that's often been a mistaken interpretation of what's going on. In Balfour's case, it's much more a historical sense than a religious sense. Now, the British Jewish community is very split over the idea of the Balfour Declaration. And there is, again, a split between elements in the Anglo-Jewish elite who are very suspicious about this, and outsider groups who are more enthusiastic about it. But I think a crucial thing to note is that two of the most important religious figures in British Jewry in 1917 back the Balfour Declaration. The chief rabbi, Joseph Hertz, who interestingly has a background in the rabbinate which involves coming over from South Africa, where he'd been a a Wheatlander during the South African War. Joseph Hertz, conveniently for the cause of the Balfour Declaration, supports Zionism. That's quite unusual amongst senior Orthodox Jewish figures of this era. And I think that plays some role in swinging Jewish opinion in favour of the Declaration. Even more strongly supportive of it is Moses Gaster, who is the chief figure in the Sephardi community, even though he's not Sephardi himself, but that's a long story. Moses Gaster is a very active Manchester Zionist. So because of this, it's easier for Jewish supporters of the Balfour Declaration to claim that they are mainstream because they can point to these mainstream figures. On the other side of the coin, the leading figure of progressive Judaism in Britain in 1917, the very established figure, Claude Montefiore, ferociously opposes the Balfour Declaration. What Montefiore is saying in 1917 and 1918 is that Judaism has been developing towards becoming a universalist religion, and that this is a step back to a more primitive ethno-nationalism. Why do we want to turn the clock back to the era of the Old Testament, when Judaism has become a much more ethical and more universalist religion than that? So there is a real dispute going on within the Jewish religious community over the Balfour Declaration right the way through to the end of the war. The ramifications of the war go in some interesting directions, and one of my favourite figures is the Congregationalist Minister William Orchard. 
He is the minister of the Kingsway Church in London, where in 1914 he's engaged in some very interesting liturgical experiments as a Congregationalist nonconformist, bringing more and more Catholic ritual into what he does. But Orchard also becomes involved almost from the outset with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And the Kingsway Church becomes a little bit of a gathering point for various Christian pacifists and radicals of various kinds. So the Anglican feminist Maud Royden and her good friend Constance Todd, a suffragist like Royden, who have been training at Mansfield College in Oxford for the ministry, she comes to Kingsway and then becomes involved in one of their satellite outposts in the east end of London. In 1917, William Orchard makes the radical step of ordaining Claude Coltman, who is Constance Todd's fiance, and Constance Todd as ministers. He also marries them on the same day, so they become a married couple of ministers. Constance Todd Coltman is, in English history, the first ordained Christian minister in a mainstream Trinitarian church. So this is an enormous and radical moment in September 1917. This is the beginning, really, in England of the story of women's ministry. Now, I think that the reason that Orchard does this is that Orchard at Kingsway in this period is becoming a genuinely radical millenarian prophet. If you read his sermons of this time, he is talking some extraordinary things about the reunification of the church, the merging together of Protestant and Catholic traditions. He's an enormous fan of Benedict XV, who, of course, by 1917, is becoming noted for his calls for a compromise peace. Orchard is picking up on this. He's also picking up, and he's associated with people like George Lansbury as well in Christian socialist circles. He's talking about the restoration of society under a reunited Christian church with the abolition of property. I actually believe that one of the things he is doing when he ordains Constance Coltman is it's a prophetic act. It's about this is the radical future where all will be made one in Christ, that there will be no distinction between rich and poor, between races, between men and women. This is the beginning of a radical religious reconstruction. Of course, it doesn't happen quite that way, although interestingly, by the end of the 1920s, Orchard converts to Catholicism, partly through his admiration for the idea of the universal church. This, of course, is somewhat strange if you think about this as the man who ordains the first woman minister in English Christianity. But at the same time, the impetus that's being created, it's not a straightforward process because in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, there's a bit of a knockback, for example, in the Church of England against women's ministry. But nevertheless, if you follow through with people like Maud Royden, this impulse towards the extension of women's ministry is one of the tributaries that comes out of the war. It's not the only one. The failure of the National Mission of Repentance and Hope is one of the things that leads William Temple to get together with the actually rather successful priest of St. Martin's in the Field in London, the Reverend Dick Shepherd, to form in July 1917 what they call the Life and Liberty Movement, which is the idea of, to some extent, actually freeing the Church of England from some of the constraints of being a state church and leading into the idea of a new form of Anglican institutional renewal. Again, some of these things feed into the post-war Lambeth Conference towards the making of modern Anglicanism. So there's a lot of things going on during the war, which I think have longer term significance in the way that religion functions in Britain. For me, one of the most moving stories of the First World War is associated with the conscientious objector, Bert Brockleby. Brockleby had been a Wesleyan Methodist, so not a particular radical religious background in 1914 terms, but he'd always been drawn to what might be called the instincts of primitive Christianity. He's quite a talented lay preacher. He's a school teacher in a Methodist church, and he's a man who is obsessed with trying to live right by the Bible. So for Brockleby, the outbreak of the war actually represents a fairly clear-cut situation. For him, it's just unthinkable to imagine Christ with a rifle and bayonet. He wants to follow the way of Christ. 
Fascinatingly, his brother enlists, although they remain in some ways quite close. And his brother certainly doesn't disown Bert when Bert becomes a conscientious objector. Bert really follows through. He's one of the conscientious objectors who is imprisoned in Richmond Castle, is threatened with court martial, is threatened with being taken to France and shot. He draws this wonderful mural of a conscientious objector being bowed down under the weight of the cross, which is the weight of conscience for Brockleby. This is what you have to do if you see yourself as a genuine follower of Christ. But in his unpublished memoir, written many years later, he also has this extraordinary story about his experiences in prison in Winchester, where he is quite struck by the generous and non-judgmental attitude of the Methodist chaplain who visits the prison and is serving the Methodist conscientious objectors. He finds this surprising because this man is fairly conventionally patriotic and has already lost a son to the war. But they become interlocutors and discussants over the issue of Bible, over the idea of conscience, and in some ways friends. And then the Methodist chaplain's second son is killed. So he's lost both his boys in the war. The conversation that he has with Burt Brockleby, who has really put himself on the line for his refusal to fight, is extraordinary. Because what the chaplain says to Brockleby is, my sons were like you. They were young men who could only follow their conscience. But what their conscience told them to do was to enlist and fight in what they saw as a just war. And just as you suffer for your conscience, and I have every admiration for you for doing that, you must understand that that's what my sons did. Brockleby is really challenged by this, because in some ways his idea of conscience had been quite simplistic. And it is in meeting this man who has a different conscientious code, which in the end Brockleby doesn't accept, he can begin to understand. The interesting thing for me that comes out of much of what I look at was the degree to which the United Kingdom understands the war in terms of conscience. It's not only serious Christian believers who think this way, but perhaps it's the serious Christian believers who are most challenged by this, whether they oppose the war or whether they support it. That's the interesting thing about this, which we've to some extent lost, that for all sides in this war, this is a matter of conscience. Professor Adrian Gregory on religion during the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Martin Daunton about the United Kingdom in 1919 and the economic legacy of the war.